The subject of, of tonight's webinar is thinking in systems. The American writer about health and public policy, Atul Gawanda, once wrote that making systems work, whether in healthcare, education, climate change, or making a pathway out of poverty is the great task of our generation. But what exactly does this rather vogueish term systems thinking mean? What are its core components? And how can it be used to reimagine government? To find out, we have a great panel tonight. Professor Deborah Blackman is a member of the Public, Social, Public Service Research Group in the School of Business at UNSW Canberra. Deborah writes frequently on, on the public service and is co-author of a 2019 paper for the research group entitled, How Can Systems Thinking Enhance Stewardship of Public Services? Our second panelist and a co-author on that paper is Luke, Dr. Luke Craven. Luke works at the Australian Tax Office and he's head of the Foresight team at the Tax Office, which works on the future of the tax and superannuation system in order to help the ATO to respond to change. Finally, Adrian Brown is Executive Director of the Centre for Public Impact based in Sweden. Adrian has more than 15 years experience working in government, performance and transformation in the UK and internationally. Adrian, I'd like to start by asking you, just, just so that we can have, can you give us some definition of what thinking in systems means and how it applies to our subject tonight, reimagining government? Well, I'll do my, I'll do my best, uh, but this is sometimes a contentious, a contentious point, uh, so I'm sure there might be other views uh, as to how to define it. But I think uh, systems thinking uh, can actually be thought of really rather simply, which is to recognize that the world around us uh, and the, uh, the organizations in which, in which we operate uh, are actually systems in which many parts are connected and many other parts. So everything is interconnected. And that's a rather different view to the more mechanistic linear view of the world in which we, we think of cause and effect as being rather neatly connected one thing to the next. So if we take a systems view, we're actually saying we reject to some extent this idea that cause and effect follow neatly. And in fact, effects have multiple causes. There are feedback loops in play. It's hard to put a boundary around uh, a particular set of activities or actions because it's, it's, the system is, is considered to be open and interconnected with, with other effects in a wider context. And so in order to approach the world, if we're thinking in that way, we have to, we have to adopt some very different practices and behaviours. And that's really what system, th systems thinking is about. Some people talk about the difference in com complicated situations and complex situations. And there's a great podcast actually called The Clock and the Cat, which uses that metaphor. A clock is complicated. You know, the fact that you can understand it by taking it apart, looking at the component parts and then putting it back together, you can understand how that works. A cat, you can take apart, you can have a look at it, but you will never really deduce the fact that a cat would purr if you stroked it. And that's, that's the difference. That's another way of thinking about the difference between complicated situations and complex situations. So systems thinking is helping us to to, to, to walk into that space of complexity uh, and, and try to respond to that in a, in a coherent way. And it relates to the reimagining government theme uh, to, to ask that part of your question in the sense that, of course, many of the challenges that we face as policymakers or in society more widely are complex in nature. And so how our governments are structured, the, what the processes and systems we follow, the way we think about policymaking, accountability, et cetera, et cetera. We, we possibly want to think a little bit more systemically if, we're, if we want to be successful in, in uh, addressing complex challenges than perhaps we have done in the past. Thanks, Adrian. Deborah, you've written about um, systems thinking a good deal. Tell us, give us your quick take on what systems thinking is, and then perhaps we might move to uh, some of the questions that have been asked around practical examples of, of systems thinking. What does it look like in government? Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose for me, picking up very much what um, Adrian was talking about, it's thinking about you've got to keep things as a whole. So our tendency has always been to try and understand things by breaking things down because that way we can control them, we can share the work out, we can look at, we can evaluate a small part of it and we can understand that. And that's been very much the way that we've 
chosen to organize ourselves and it's been about the way we do governance and it's about the way we make decisions and it's about the way we do project management and project program management in government and it works really well in terms of being able to allocate things and make things accountable but it doesn't work nearly as well in achieving the things that you actually wanted to achieve because it's the interconnectedness of things that creates the, the change in the system that you want and I think one of the things that is really useful to think about is the fact that one of the things that happens with um, a system particularly with the complex system is that by being part of it we change it and so what we're thinking, of, one of the problems with breaking it down is that we may be able to understand that bit. We've, we've changed the larger part as part of that. In, in the, we've, made, we've changed the nature of what we're looking at and that can become part of an issue as, as we'll go through that. So um, I think when we then start to think about that in terms of examples, it starts to become clearer. So I work very much in the people and system space looking at HR and there's much discussion all the time about the need for alignment and we need to make sure that all the different parts of HR fit together, which sounds great. But then what happens is we then have a recruitment team and a development team and um, uh, a team that's looking at remuneration and performance. And although there is some discussion about the fact they have to work together, the implication of what happens in one part is not well understood when we when they realize what they've done elsewhere and a colleague of mine sue, sue williamson frequently does what she does she looks at all the policies and puts them together in a systemic map and starts to realize that actually this isn't going to work the way you wanted it to because this bit and this bit are actually working against each other so one of the first things we can do is we can look at the things we've done in terms of our governance to realize how the bits are working together or working against each other and so maybe that's my first example for you Thanks very much, Deborah. Luke, you're a public servant. Tell me, why is systems thinking popular now, do you think? Um, it seems that in some ways it's a response to the increasing complexity of the problems uh, governments face. Um, is, that, is that your feeling about it? I mean, it's, it's become a very, um, I suppose, fashionable concept in recent times. Why do you think that is and what particular problem in government is, is systems thinking trying to address? Thanks, James. And I might uh, start by answering your question in a slightly different place, um, which is to ad lib off some of Deborah and Adrian's comments about how we define or think about systems thinking in government or how systems thinking connects to reimagining government. Because um, I think the tendency in this conversation um, is to actually create straw men. Uh, you know, I don't think there is a, a systems thinking utopia and I don't think there is a linear reductionist thinking dystopia in our world. I don't think thinking in systems or not thinking in systems is a binary choice. Uh, and many of the people on the line will be familiar with a famous American systems thinker, Diana Meadows, um, who did a lot of work trying to build the capacity of governments and civil society actors to do more systems work. Um, and one of, one of the things that she used to get very frustrated about was this tendency to say, if we just had more systems thinking, the world would be a better place. Uh, actually, we need different styles of thinking for different problems. Uh, and actually, systems thinking will often go hand in hand with our more structured approaches to problem solving, um, which might need to, by necessity, focus on a particular piece of the problem in isolation from others. Um, and so one of the ways that we talk about this in the ATO is that there's a necessity to operate at different levels of Zoom simultaneously so that we can solve the very neat challenges that we have to in Westminster forms of government with, uh, you know, kind of necessary silos or um, single point ministerial accountability while also taking seriously what systems thinkers have been talking about, as Adrian said, which is seeing that bigger picture, recognizing there's no linear cause and effect, confronting that complexity. Uh, why do I think this is quite an in vogue uh, topic of conversation right now? Um, I think partly it is uh, because of an increasing recognition of the complexity of public sector challenges. Um, and probably an increasing um, kind of networked approach to the way that we solve a lot of public sector problems. Um, it's not just government departments that do the work of public service. 
And I think as we've moved into a public sector environment where that's more than normal, um, we've had to think more deliberately and more intentionally about the frameworks we use to manage ourselves and to, to manage the delivery of public services. And perhaps that's naturally led us to systems thinking and complex systems approaches. Thanks, Luke. That's really interesting. Let's, Adrian, tell us about you. You look at governments around the world. Can you give examples of governments who you think are thinking effectively in systems? And what does that look like? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think, uh, again, picking up on what's, what's already been said, we, uh, we perhaps sometimes have a tendency to think of this, of systems uh, thinking or complexity uh, approaches as being a, a big thing that requires this massive shift across, across the whole of government. And maybe sort of in the long, long term, that's true. But I think if we, if we look at different parts of different governments around the world, there's tons of systems thinking taking place all the time. And in fact, I imagine most people on this call who do who work in public service in any way are actually using the principles of systems thinking in their day-to-day, -day, whether they call it that or not. Uh, so, for example, if you're focusing on, on relationships and not just on sort of uh, the, the um, points in a system, if you're thinking about how different parts of a system interact, if you're trying to reach across si organizational silos and say, how can we collaborate? Uh, if you're thinking about, as Luke was just saying, outside of the boundaries of your organization, these are all system thinking practices, and I'm sure we can all think of examples of that. I would highlight one actually uh, in Australia very right now, which is uh, I was listening to Chris Eccles yesterday, the uh, Victorian uh, secretary uh, in, in DPC, and he was describing the, the, the response to coronavirus across government. And he was talking about how they've oriented around missions, how they've tried to completely get out of the silos because they recognize that they weren't going to work in terms of the complex response and, and fast moving response required for Corona, how they were thinking about outcomes. Um, so I would say that's a great example of systems thinking. I'm sure we could all say, well, look, there are some ways we could improve it or go further, but that is, that is systems thinking. Another one I'd point to outside of the Australian context is uh, in Finland where they, they talk about experimental approaches to government. So rather than setting uh, policy as a, a definitive sort of statement of what they want to achieve and how they're going to achieve it, they say, well, look, this is the direction we want to head. Let's, let's take an, out, uh, uh, an explicitly experimental approach. Let's try things, let's see what happens, and let's, let's uh, bring people together from a diverse range of uh, across government and outside of government to talk about it and then, and then improve it. That's a systems approach. And there are many, many, many others that I, that I could list around the world. So I think it's perhaps a case of us getting a little bit more awareness for the characteristics of, of, of systems and systems approaches, spotting them in our own practice and our own work, and then asking how we can improve. So what's the next step from where we are, rather than uh, perhaps setting ourselves up for, this, for, for a great leap into this sort of systems future that perhaps feels a bit more... Um, a bit more difficult to achieve and is, and is unrealistic. Just quickly before I um, turn to um, Deborah and Luke, it's really interesting, Adrian, you mentioned the Finnish example because uh, in your telling, Finland has um, promoted an experimental approach to, to policy making. That tends to run up, doesn't it, in typical, in traditional government systems against government's greater aversion to risk. And uh, we'll try something, it fails, we'll get flogged. Uh, we'll get flogged in the media, we'll get flogged at the polls, what, what, whatever. How has Finland managed to do that? That, that always seems to me a particular um, uh, stumbling block to, to systems thinking, which is very much about trialling things, seeing if they work. Systems are complex. We don't know how the system's going to respond, so let's trial stuff. But that's often difficult in real world, world politics. It, you're right, and I think maybe the Finnish, you know, it's, it's, it's important not to say let's copy and paste. I mean, that's another thing about systems is you can't just say what worked over here will definitely work over there. Finland is a, is a unique country. I'm, I'm talking to you from Sweden, by the way. So I'm sort of in, in the region, uh, <laughs> Sweden's a particular view of the Finns, you know, culturally as to, as to how that society operates there. And, it, and it's a bit more cohesive. There's perhaps less adversarial nature between between government and politics which allow between the media and, and, and politics which allows um maybe what i've just described to happen but i'd say you know look at uh, look at local government that one of the uh, i think the next in the series of, in this uh, uh, in these webinars is about relationships and donna hall is speaking about the work she's done in the uk 
in Wigan, where she, it, you know, it's a, it's a traditional council set up with the, the political side, the administrative side. She helped to create an entirely new culture, which was focused on relationships, but removed a lot of the top-down accountability control. And that was done within, she didn't change the political realities, I suppose, that was done within, within the system that she's working. So I, yeah, of course, it's all, there are always reasons why these things are difficult, and let's not hold ourselves to some, some ridiculous ideal that, that's completely unachievable. But I think in any situation, you can ask yourself, what, can we, what steps can we take? What are the adjacencies from where we are now that would allow us to introduce a bit more of these kinds of concepts? And, and will they help us to achieve better outcomes? Because our hypothesis, I suppose, is that they will. Thanks, Adrian. Deborah, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. Your paper that you co-wrote with Luke is a really, I recommend it to everybody. It's a very, um, it's a very clear-eyed uh, assessment of, of, the, of the progress of systems thinking. Um, and in fact, you talk about um, unemployment services and how, how, in a ways, how difficult it is to introduce a systems thinking approach when um, we have such a um, a system that is public and private and NGOs and, and you know, the, the complexity of systems makes, makes it hard to do that. How do we measure and evaluate whether systems thinking has been successful? What, what would you say? Well, I think if we pick up from what Adrian was just saying, one of the issues is trying to work out why it is you're doing what you're doing. And when one of the, the big problems, I think, um, when we're trying to develop systems thinking and picking up from what Luke was saying, you know, there's, there's times when it's contextually appropriate and times when it's just, you know, it's what we're doing, but we don't think about it. Other times we really need to think how we're going to build those relationships and work across things. And one of the ways of doing that is to really understand the purpose of why we're trying to do it. And one of the issues I think for me is often, we focus on the problem and not what the end state will look like, not, not where it is we're trying to go. And so when you're looking at measurement, if you've worked out what you think the answer is, then you're going to have problems with the measurement because anything that isn't that is going to be a failure. Whereas actually the fact that you're interacting with a complex system means that the only place you're not going to end up is that place you thought you were going to be. And one of the hard bits is accepting that that's okay, that it's because as you, the, the way that you understand the, the issue as it is now, when you talk to all those people and when everything starts to work together, that's not going to be the way you understand it in the end. You'll have a better understanding and you will have a better view of your system, but it won't be the way you thought it was because as Adrian said, you know, one of the issues is it's contextual. You're open to the context. It's going to change because of what's going on around you. So it's all going to keep moving. And one of the conversations I have with Luke a lot of the time is actually, how do we measure movement? How do we make it that, and in a way with the finished example, how is it that we say, we're not trying to work out have we got to X, but are we going in a direction that is interesting? Are we, can we see that there is traction? Are we going to try and work out, can you evaluate whether relationships are working, for example, rather than did you do X? I'm doing some work with Jean Hartley and uh, Fiona Buick looking at some work that's been where there's been some really successful collaborations in different places and one of the things we've realized is that actually to collaborate effectively is really difficult and that it's a skill and so if we're thinking about systems thinking it's about we, we don't want everybody to think the same way we want that tension we want the differences and in a way to understand why we need those, te for those tensions and differences is that because you can't have change unless something is understood in a different way. So what you might want to be looking at is, well, how, how do we want to see the, the understandings change? Can we evaluate that there's a movement in the way that people are thinking? And you can probably do that. And um, Luke will probably be able to talk about that a lot with what they're doing with the ATO. So in a way, I think it's about saying, do we know where we're going and why we're going there? And it is not, do we know exactly where we're going, but do we understand the journey that we want to be moving to? And do we have a view of not exactly what it will look like when it's working, but do we have some idea of what the purpose is? Because purpose will overcome culture and it means you don't necessarily need to do all the big restructuring that we think about. We talk about trying to break down silos. And I can't remember who it was who used to say, stop worrying about the walls and the doors. What you need is a lot of really good bridges and windows because that will enable you to get across and around and through without trying to rebuild the whole thing. And I always remember thinking, yes, that, where are the windows, where are the bridges? That will give us a different way of thinking about the flow. We have to acknowledge though, don't we, um, this is for you, Luke, that the, the take up of systems thinking has been pretty slow, hasn't it? 
the case seems pretty compelling in lots of ways. That clearly we we operate in systems. If we don't understand the complexity of the system, the relationships within the system, um, the systems are complex and change quickly in ways we can't predict, then we're, we're not going to succeed. Why do you think, and and do you think that the take up of systems thinking has been slow in government? Uh, so I think this is a yes and no answer, James. So I don't think that the take up or adoption of systems thinking has been slow across government at all. I actually think um, there's quite widespread use as Deborah and Adrian have alluded to. And a lot of the time people don't recognize or name what they're doing as thinking in systems or taking a complex systems approach to a problem. And indeed, there are countless examples of uh, local governments across the UK and in Australia thinking very deliberately about doing systems work and naming it that way. And increasingly, there are examples uh, in Australia and New Zealand state uh, and national governments. I think one of the challenges here is storytelling um, and a lack of good storytelling and sharing of success stories. And part of that challenge, and this goes to measurement, is that it is hard to tell the counterfactual. Um, and so as Adrian said, you know, our hypothesis is that systems thinking make things, makes things better, um, but it's really hard to demonstrate that value because we don't have a lot of the time the counterfactual to the level of specificity or to the level of generalization that we might hope. Um, and I think one of the, one of the challenges here, and a colleague of all of ours, Toby Lowe, has written a lot about the challenges of setting targets um, or key performance indicators in a complex system. And the irony on, is not lost on me that we often set targets for the use of systems approaches, uh, even though that, that probably does not resonate with the intent of taking an approach like that. Um, I don't think that there are any easy answers to this. Another um, well-known systems thinker, Dave Snowden, talks about targets that he calls vector targets, uh, which is essentially sort of speed and direction of travel against intensity of effort. Uh, and you know, can we can we measure the attempts to make change in the public sector using targets like that uh, instead of outcome-based performance measures? I think that that's a really interesting possibility. Um, to answer, the no, uh, to answer the other part of that question though, which is related to the adoption of um, systems thinking in government, I think where adoption has been slow is in scaling systems thinking up. Uh, and so, you know, uh, shifting it from something that is used in the delivery or design of particular policies, programs or services to being a macro approach that helps us do the work of government. Um, and I think there are a number of reasons why, you know, change of that macro nature is slow, but I think there are some specific reasons related to what systems thinking is and what it tries to achieve that makes that difficult in the kind of governments that we operate in, at least in places like the UK, uh, New Zealand and Australia. And people have heard me talk about this before, very likely, but those are things like accountability frameworks, risk frameworks, project management frameworks, uh, the relationship between government um, and the public sector, um, all of which in their own ways limit the ability for systems thinking to operate at scale in our public sector environments. So while widespread adoption, I think is something that we can claim across government at the kind of lower level or at the program or policy level, it's probably something that we can't say is omnipresent at the level of uh, kind of operating models of government. And I think we, we would need to think actively about removing some of those impediments to get that kind of success. They're, they're very powerful impediments, aren't they? And uh, do you have any thoughts about how they might be removed? Can I just say, while we're, t we're chatting, if people have examples of their own participants, please put them into the chat. That will, that will really help the discussion as well. But, but Luke, let me, ta let me throw that back to you just quickly. We've got a couple more minutes before we go to our chat room. Yeah, and, and actually, so um, even though I'm, I'm in Australia, I'm a, I'm a Kiwi originally, um, people can probably hear the twang, even though the accent's been uh, roundly beaten out of me. 
Um, Again, sort of public sector nerds on the line will know that there's um, some very interesting public sector reform going on in New Zealand at the moment, quite focused on um, changing the accountability structures in government. So rather than um, public sector chief executives being accountable to one minister, they'll be accountable to uh, kind of cross departmental boards of ministers who actually, in a very similar way to uh, the work that Chris Eccles has been doing in Victoria, orient their work around missions rather than um, kind of domain-based departmental structures. Um, I think that's a very promising way, not only to change the way that accountability structures work, but also to think about the way that um, we imagine large pieces of transformation that cut across government. Um, there's, there's one idea, why don't I throw that on the file? Thanks, Luke. Um, we're just going to go to a chat room, but I just want to say two things from the chat that we've gotten. Kerry Willis has asked the, the good question, what does operating at scale mean? Um, that's something that we should think of, which means something that is across a whole, a whole system, not just in one pilot, but can actually be, be um, scaled right across um, a, you know, a, a service delivery system. Um, correct me if, if, if anyone can to find that better. But I also like Martin Cobble's um, comment, this question, is the lack of scaling uh, about not having systems thinkers in the right positions within government? Um, and do we need to do something about that? So that's just the question. I'm not going to throw that to the panel right now because we're about to go to our chat rooms. I might um, ask you, Adrian, um, what came up in your discussion and particularly uh, was there any anything coming up of our current moment, in particular in relation to COVID nineteen? Did that come into your discussion? Um, how how a crisis like this impacts on systems thinking, and how systems thinking can be valuable in in addressing that? Yeah, the the the, the current situation I think is, is is particularly interesting because for those for those of us that think of this as a paradigm shift in thinking. A, a moment of crisis is a moment in which everything's up in the air, there's a lot of flux, and the possibility of changing the sort of fundamental way we think about the world is, is perhaps more realistic. So I think a lot of the, a lot of the conversation um, around, around the, the current crisis uh, has been about how it's challenging some of perhaps our fundamental assumptions about what we value, how, how the world works, how organisations work, um, and I think it's leading to a, obviously a much bigger conversation than just just government, but about society as a whole. How we uh, how, how do we want to build uh, build back better, or how do you want to describe it post post crisis? And I think that does create a real opportunity for those of us that believe that some of the ideas of systems thinking have have, have something to offer here. Um, that that flux and that openness, I think, that many people have to thinking differently about how we want to uh, organize ourselves is, is, is a really significant opportunity that we don't want to miss. Deborah, what do you, what do you think? I've, I've got a comment here from Robin Perry, who, who says, as a former public servant, it is clear to me that institutional silos are the fundamental impediment for systems thinking. Um, and that these silos are usually underpinned by competing agendas, which undermine the willingness to collaborate. I wonder if you think that's true and, and also what the COVID-19 pandemic might mean for, for that problem, if, if it is a problem. I think it's, there's no question that we see that and that we have that. It's the competing agendas that's the issue. So it's about, it comes in back in a way to how are we rewarding certain behaviours and how are we measuring and evaluating success? Because if the success is that you can achieve your agenda, even if it's going to reduce the capacity to achieve the long-term outcome, then inevitably that is going to be a problem. So it's, there, we come back to governance, which in a way is what we've all been talking about as, as we've gone through, is how do you choose, if you think about what governance is, it's how do you choose to organize yourself? And so what we're saying is that we, we set up silos for all sorts of very efficient reasons, but that those silos then take on a life of themselves, their own. And, unless there is some way of building the relationships across that mean that you, the bigger picture becomes part of what you're doing, then you will have that issue. And I always remember I was doing a review of a very large organization uh, of their committee structure. And I said, they said, what have you learned? And I said, well, the most important thing is you must never call anything 
um, a committee that you don't want to make decisions because you've got stuff all over the place here that should be working parties. We've got working groups that have been ma managing to create jobs for them and not um, uh, employment, but they've been managed to find something to do for f at least 15 years longer than they were supposed to be going for. So there's a whole bunch of stuff around how we review our governance and how we set it up that's really important. So um, it's not just that you know we, we can't do it, but I think it's about saying, why are we continually rewarding the things that we don't necessarily want to happen? And the answer to that is often is because we've always done it that way. And we've got to, you know, to do it differently, coming back to the conversation we're having about innovation, it's got, there's got to be a capacity to take a risk to try something new. And it's not that we can't necessarily do that, but it's that it can be difficult to do it without there being problems on the way and that who's going to make that okay can be the difficulty. Now, often we find coming back to the scale issue, lots of people can do lots of things locally. And I, um, many people who have heard me say this story before, that I went to some innovation awards. And the thing that worried me the most was every single people who won, every single one of the teams that won, thanked their manager for keeping them hidden while they did it. <laughs> so the fact was that they could get it done and once once they'd done it everybody was really pleased about it but it was it was hidden until then but most of what they were doing was actually systems thinking because they were working in different ways across different groups and getting things done and then they were announcing it later so it, I think it's that we, it's not that we can't do it it's that we're continually trying to work out how to do those things so yes I agree with his comment that completely that this is a, a major thing that we have but in a way, I guess it comes back to this issue of, of, of how do we work across it rather than accepting it? So that's probably a rather long answer, but. No, thank you, Deborah. Look, let me ask you, there's some interesting comments coming up, people saying things like, uh, you know, we're tweaking these systems through system thinking. Um, systems thinking works better in small situations, perhaps local government rather than national government. Um, there's, there's a sense in the chat that people are, I suppose, uh, perhaps a little sceptical of the, the capacity of systems thinking to work in big systems, say at the Commonwealth level or, or Commonwealth state level, for example. I, I wonder what you think about that and whether, uh, another thing I'm struck is we're not getting a lot of examples of systems thinking that has actually worked. And so it's important that we be, I suppose, clear eyed about this. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so maybe I can talk about a, a couple of tangible examples that are particularly, or that are happening particularly at the Commonwealth level of the Australian government, which is the one that I'm the most familiar with. Uh, and I won't start by talking about the ATO. Uh, I'll talk about another agency first. Um, and so the, the Department of um, Jobs and Small Business, uh, which has gone through a name change and it's hard to keep up, uh, is doing a lot of really interesting work thinking about how a employment services market works using a complex systems uh, approach as its underpinning. Um, again, thinking differently and asking large questions about uh, accountability, attribution of outcomes, um, payment by results, all of these kinds of questions uh, that you know we need to answer if we're going to achieve at the use of systems thinking at scale. And those are big market design questions. Uh, the employment services market is the second largest uh, outsourced government service. Uh, it is a significant draw on the public purse. And there is some phenomenal work going on to reimagine how that is done from a complex systems perspective. What is really interesting about that piece of work uh, as well is that the first step in implementing that approach has been to think about how the department can build the capability of its staff and of its senior leadership to do more of this systems work so that when the market design recommendations come to them, it naturally resonates with the way that they see the world. And I think, you know, Deborah's point about systems thinking often happens while it's hidden, I think is a point that's well made. Uh, and we do need to approach this from both a top down and bottom up perspective. I think then from the perspective of, of the ATO, so one of the things that I'm, you know, excites me and gets me out of bed in the morning is that um, our organization 
is tasked with the regulation and stewardship of two very large systems. So you know, the, the tax system being one and the superannuation system being the other. And we actually talk about um, the work that we do as taking a holistic focus on systems health. Now at a high level, that's you know, in a, a strategic goal or something that we, we um, orient around as a vision or as a mission, but it does then flow down to the initiatives and the activities that we work on as an organization uh, to recognize that the work that we do in one part of the system has to plug in and connect with programs and initiatives that we have in other parts of the system. Uh, so at that very macro level, we are taking a deliberately and intentionally um, systems-based approach. So I think the examples, the examples are there. Um, and the irony is it's it's you know it's governance, it's governance work, as Debbie says, and governance work isn't sexy. Um, no one really cares a great deal about how governments work. They care about what governments deliver. Uh, and so I think it's part of the challenge in this space is telling the story of how uh, working in different ways and reimagining the business of government can deliver value to citizens and taxpayers. And I think it does, you know, anecdotal evidence um, in different parts of the world shows that when you take a more human, a more systems led approach to the work that, that you do, um, you do uh, deliver services that people value more or that meet their needs at a higher level than would have happened under a different system. So I think it's about capturing those stories of success and communicating them. Um, but I, but I don't, yeah, I, I do disagree with with this belief that it's not happening because I think it is happening. It's just about building that that critical mass and momentum. And you know, probably Deborah, Adrian, and I can all reflect on the fact that we've been involved in this conversation for a long time. Uh, and you know, certainly in the last eighteen months, two years, there has been a huge upswing in interest and activity in this space. And that is not just interest for the sake of interest, it's interest because there's good work happening and it's just about magnifying and amplifying that work. Thanks very much, Luke. Um, one thing that's coming up in the chat, uh, Adrian, I'm gonna throw this to you. Is collaboration the same thing as systems thinking? How, how do they differ? And if I can throw a question of my own on top of that, and it's a related question is, is there a, an element of reinventing our democracy through systems thinking? That one of the ideas in systems thinking is about having people who are users of a system or a service being involved in, in the design of policies that affect them. For example, be interested in your thoughts on, on those two questions. Just, just small questions to finish us off, which, which is always, uh, it's always good. Um, on is, is collaboration the same systems thinking? I think collaboration is, is, is a necessary but not sufficient condition. So I think within systems thinking, you would expect to see far more collaborative approaches, but you can collaborate in ways that are more mechanistic, I, I suppose, if you want to. So it's not the same as, but you'd expect to see it. Um, as for sort of reinventing democracy uh, in, in 30 seconds, I think that uh, what systems thinking implies is that you want to create a space for dialogue and, and, and to have an, an opportunity for different views to be brought to bear on a problem because by nature you need that diversity of thinking if you're going to make progress in, in a, using a systems logic. And I think our, our systems of democracy and accountability can often mitigate against that because they encourage us to have solutions that get sort of uh, described in detail at the outset and, and, and are done by perhaps a small group of clever people at, at the top. Um, but we do know through uh, the work of, of, of many who've been thinking about delib more deliberative approaches to democracy, uh, citizens' juries, uh, bringing using human-centered design approaches to service uh, to thinking about services. There are other ways of bringing voices in to a conversation that aren't the kind of four-year electoral cycle. I've seen a lot of comments in, in, the, in the chat about you know how does this fit with a four-year electoral cycle? Well, I think you know, that that is a constraint that we have to work within. But there are many other ways of creating space for dialogue, listening, 
um, within within that that are democratic and, and and other mechanisms that we can explore. For me, as a sort of closing thought here before on the hour, I think that um, one concept, one idea is one of humility. I think the more we can recognize that each of us, whether the, whether the prime minister or anybody else, we cannot control everything, we cannot fix everything. And if we are humble and open uh, to bring others into the discussion, uh, to think more broadly about solutions, then that feels to me like um, a sort of useful heuristic if we want to move forward on this. Let's just be concrete in these last 15 minutes and talk about how might we apply a systems lens to a really difficult problem. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned before um, Australia's uh, uh, shocking rates of, in, of Indigenous incarceration, uh, deaths in custody, which continued despite a Royal Commission in, in the early 90s. That's, that's just one example of an incredibly difficult uh, problem against which governments seem to have made very little progress. Deborah, can I start with you? Can I, <laughs> I, I know it's not an easy question, but how would you... How would you marshal systems thinking to address a really difficult, painful policy uh, problem like, like, like that? Well, there's a couple of things that have been striking me as I've been reading all the, the, the chat and a couple of things that we haven't talked about. And so maybe one of the things to start with is the concept of emergence, which is that when we talk, when we talk about systems, one of the things that we know is that things will emerge out of the, the, the way all the relationships take place. And so, and I was being struck in the conversation that I had in, in the breakout room and looking at what's happening is that because we try uh, in the way that procurement works, for example, we try to predict all the things that can be happening around this thing, which means that when we get emergence, we think somehow we failed. And so one of the things that's difficult is to work out how do we enable emergence and one of the things that um, Luke was involved in um, at the end of last year was was um, I'm having a complete mental blank about his name at the moment but it came out from Lancelli Chase and he was talking about trying to do some intractable problems and getting the different stakeholders to think about what would this actually look like if it was working so let's stop talking about the problem for a minute. But for each of the different stakeholders, Julian Corner, thank you. Um, what would this look like? So if, if we were in the future horizon and everything was working, how, what would we see? And one of the questions I often ask people is, if I was looking at this when it was working successfully in a few years time, what would I see that I don't see now? And how would I, how would I recognize that it is now effective and that it's actually, working in a different way and that changes the conversation for each of the stakeholders to start to say well because there's a tendency always to look to start from the problem and you've got to change the conversation to say okay we know that this is the problem we understand that this is the problem but we keep talking about this so let's talk about something else what would it what would that look like for you and you can then start to realize often and this is what Julian was talking about what that looked like was the same and so they suddenly realized that although they were, there were lots of very different perspectives, there was one thing they were actually agreed on and they could start to talk about that. And in a way it's about, for me, it's about, well, if we've done all of this and it hasn't worked, the, the only thing we know for certain is that we have to do something different because if we keep doing more of the same, that's not going to change anything. So, it's, it's where can you make an intervention in a way it comes back to um, Luke talked about the Nella Meadows earlier on. What are the leverage points that you currently are using? Because they're clearly not the ones that are working for changing the system. So how can you use a different leverage point? How can you change the way that you're actually engaging with what's going on? And so that's where I would be starting is saying, well, how can we do this not not think about necessarily what we want to do but how can we actually engage and do the whole thing in a different way luke can i get you to jump in there do, do you think i mean we've always consulted haven't we <laughs> is there some new way that systems thinking requires us to consult and engage um, to, to genuinely be open to the perspectives of people in the system including the people who who are most affected by it is there a difference so we warned you, James, that uh, Adrian, Deborah, and I were going to be in furious agreement. And so to 
I guess, echo some of the comments that have already been made. Um, I actually think the key to this discussion is humility um, and recognising that anyone only can see and engage with a particular part of the system. So even when we say something like, I'm a systems thinker or I do systems thinking, the risk in making a statement like that is that you can confidently claim that you see or understand the entire system in operation, which we know not to be the case. Um, so, you know, that the epistemic humility that comes with being a systems thinker is recognizing that you have a particular perspective on and understanding of the system um, and the problems that might be uh, kind of deeply ingrained in a particular system or, or set of systems. And so how do we use systems thinking to approach a, a wicked or an intractable problem? And it's as much about the mindset that we use to approach that problem as it is the tools that we use. And I think it's obviously a combination of both. But if I can talk quite briefly about you know, two of the principles that we hold dear at, uh, at the ATO in the way that we use systems thinking and design thinking hand in hand to just echo a comment um, that Sarah Herkham has made in the chat about the natural resonance of these two approaches. We say that when we, when we start a piece of systems work, the first thing that we need to do is engage a diversity of perspectives. Uh, and that is because different perspectives have a different uh, kind of slant on that particular system. They see a different part of it. Um, they see different connections. They um, place different value on different connections. And if you're going to deal with the systems challenge, you need to actively engage those different perspectives. I think you're right, James. We've always consulted, um, but we've not consulted perhaps with a systems mindset that does it, recognizing that that's the particular value of, of engaging those diverse perspectives. And then the second thing that we, we talk a lot about is building a shared understanding. Um, and that's not the same as a consensus understanding. So I think the work of, of systems thinking and the work of, of systems change is deeply human work. Uh, it is about conversation and connection and relationships. Um, and it is about humility and empathy. Um, and so, you know, if we ask ourselves at a, at a big picture level, what do those things then mean for the work of government or of reimagining government? And what's the role of government in those conversations? In many ways, I think the role of government is to create the spaces in which those conversations can occur. Um, the spaces where people feel safe to uh, and able to share their perspectives on systemic challenges and where the, it's possible to build connections across those different perspectives into something that we might call a shared understanding. It's really interesting, Luke, and we're coming now to the personal aspect of systems thinking, the, the work. Claire Mullins has written a really good um, comment uh, in the chat where she writes, I think it's important that a big piece of systems thinking is the inner work required by all agents in the system, the surfing, surfacing of one's own unconscious bias, the realising of the, the role that each, each of us plays. And uh, the Donella Meadows piece, I don't know if Thea Snow has shared the link to that. There's a terrific piece by Donella Meadow, Meadows about about the, the, the human side of systems thinking that I urge you all to read. We've got five minutes left. Um, I wanna pick up a comment, a question made by Bhuvana in the chat, and it's about the national cabinet here in Australia. And I'm gonna throw it to our panel, and Adrian, you should feel free to jump in as well, because you're probably aware of it. But as everybody here knows, we've had a national cabinet running the country, uh, the federal government and state and territory leaders, uh, for some, some months now, and uh, a lot has been done. What are the systems thinking implications of the National Cabinet? Does the National Cabinet model present any uh, opportunities to implement systems thinking uh, in an ongoing way once we get past this pandemic time? And anyone feel free to jump in. In a way, it reminds me a little bit of some of the work we do around disaster recovery, which this is what this is about. And the reality is that when there was a crisis, as Adrian said earlier on, everybody's very focused and everybody can work together because they've got a, a it comes back to Luke's point, there's a shared understanding of what needs to happen. People can move very quickly because of that. 
But then what happens is we come into what's called recovery. And if you look at disaster life cycles, they, it goes around at the moment, it always seems to be in a loop. And I always worry about the word recovery because it automatically implies you're trying to get back to where you were before. And there's lots of discussion at the moment about that we shouldn't be trying to do that. But the question is then, well, how do we not do that? How do we not automatically revert back to the behaviors that we had before? And there's a, there, there seems to be an assumption at the moment that because this crisis happened, there will be a change. And I think there is the opportunity for there to be a change, but that if that's going to happen, coming back to systems thinking, there's going to have to be a, a, a positive decision that they want something to be different because they can see an advantage out of that. But otherwise, there was a very strong possibility, I think, that we will, there will be, a, it comes back to the competing agendas that we heard about earlier on, that there will be a move back. So, the, so my personal view is, I think there was an opportunity for there to be change, but I don't think we should assume that there should, will be, because all of the, the disaster uh, recovery literature will tell us that it's not, it's not automatic at all. Adrian, I'm gonna ask you to finish, uh, to wrap up, and um, not to talk about the National Cabinet, but about the principles of, this moment of crisis, if you like, what are the opportunities presented by this moment? What are the threats as well, if you like, but how might we take this period in which, you know, we've been highly governed, <laughs> if you like, and how might we take some of those lessons and apply them to, to, to government, you know, once we come out of this time and the systems thinking lessons I'm, I'm talking about. And if you can address that, we'll, we'll wrap up. Sure. Um, well, I, I do think that what this moment has created is the opportunity to rethink. A lot of things have changed very rapidly in many, in many uh, jurisdictions that people have been trying for years for change and they changed them overnight. So it shows us what's possible and it's, and it's focused us perhaps more on the important things in life, frankly, um, and, and allowed us to, 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 to come together around that, around that common sort of sense of challenge. I think the opportunity there is exactly as Deborah was just saying, is that we don't just then snap back to where we've come from, but we take time. And I think this is the challenge is how can we create the space in the crisis now when we're, st when st we're still really scrambling around, but how can we find that space to reflect and to ask ourselves, what, what do we think is important now? What lessons have we learned from, from the, past few months and what does that imply for what we want to try next again i don't think we should be saying here's you know we, we know exactly the answer that we want to be shooting for because i'm not i'm not sure that's possible but what are the things that we can start to try what do we feel it's now safe to try that we didn't think was safe to try previously that might help us to build something better post-crisis and i don't know a lot about the national cabinet but my understanding is that it it in one sense, it's put politics aside for a second and, and, and allowed for a much more cross-partisan uh, approach. That seems to me to be something which if we can recognize the value of and invest in supporting, that would be a very worthwhile activity. And the reason I'm hopeful about this is we've spent the last 20 years or longer in public management, investing an enormous amount of time and energy thinking about how to better manage and control people in all sorts of different ways. We've come up, we've, we've invented very many, many ways of having KPIs, for example. So we, an enormous energy has gone into that. If we can invest even part of the energy that we've invested in the last two decades in thinking about how we can have more open, uh, collaborative, uh, uh, discursive ways of approaching problems, then we would set ourselves up for a great level of success. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a great willingness to do that. So why don't we just do it, I think. What a great place to end. Thank you, Adrian. Um, we're at 6.15, so time has run out. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's been a really terrific webinar and your contributions have really made a difference. So I wanna thank our panel, Adrian Brown, Luke Craven, Deborah Blackman. Thank you so much for, for your engagement and um, thank you all for, for coming.